Hello and welcome to Policy Debate, South African Libertarians podcasting platform. My name is Martin van Staden. I am a third year law student at the University of Pretoria as well as a member of the African Executive Board of Students for Liberty. I am joined by my colleagues Nicholas Woodsmith and Christian van Heistien. <clears throat> who will introduce themselves properly in a moment. Today's topic concerns transformation, a buzzword in South Africa which is taken to mean radical social change, mostly in a racial but also gender sense, from a pre to a post apartheid context. This is a very broad topi topic, so we'll need to <clears throat> approach it from a more narrow perspective, that being the recent controversy on our university campuses. Earlier this year, a group known as Rhodes Must Fall succeeded in having a statue of Cecil John Rhodes, a historical prime minister of the Cape Colony, removed from the campus of the University of Cape Town. A group known as Open Stellenbosch has caused transformation to become a dominant theme when considering the University of Stellenbosch. They believe that black students are being mistreated and that the university has an institutionalized culture of racism. Now, I detail my opinion on transformation in a recent article on our blog, uh, which will obviously be in the description below. I believe that transformation is essentially akin to a state ideology, wherein everyone is being forced to toe the ideological line. I feel it is not all too dissimilar from the underlying methodology of apartheid, as a, a system of social engineering, essentially. In the article I said that I feel this kind of transformation is not real transformation but simply a con continuation of the same system of collectivism, statism and totalitarianism. For real change we need to move closer to individualism, personal autonomy and libertarianism. And yes, uh, that is my view. Uh, Christian. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Christian van Eistien. I'm a uh currently a accounting honors student at Stellenbosch University and I have some strong opinions about what's been happening and uh, ever since the roads must fall and it's now come to Stellenbosch and uh, unfortunately or fortunately we don't have a, a, a statue that uh, or a symbol that can be focused or zoomed in on so our entire language policy is supposedly now the, the target of all this interest and and so on and it's just it's bizarre that all of a sudden these these students uh, all these students they they complain about the the language policy and and I still I ask them but why did you come here if you have a problem with the language policy or and then they say no you don't understand or or this you don't understand the complexities or something but it's still it's for me it's very simple I don't know and Nicholas do you have any thoughts no just add to that before introducing myself you don't go to McDonald's unless you want to buy McDonald's <laughs> but um, I'm uh, Nicholas Woodsmith I'm a first year at UCT studying politics philosophy and economic history um, I'd first like to apologize even though I wasn't involved so just because you know apparently we need to apologize collectively all the time apologize for being in the same university as the people who kind of started this crap um, and just uh, I, I really agree with you that there's really no way that they can argue around the fact that you go to Stellenbosch because you want to study in Afrikaans it's an Afrikaans university it's always been so and it should always be so and it's the right of the university to be so I'm English and that's why I didn't go to uh, Stellenbosch because I knew that I wouldn't do that well there because I don't really understand the language and the thing is that there are plenty of other universities which actually are of also go good quality like uh, the, uh, around the country that pe non um, Afrikaans speakers could have gone to so there's just no excuse. And um, just how it, this th thing of transformation has been affecting UCT. Um, with RMF, uh, the, yes, we had a symbol that um, they could destroy, but and it has thankfully weakened since then, but it has uh, uh, strengthened quite a lot of the, as we call them quite sarcastically, the social justice warriors on campus. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, so... A lot of the groups like there's, we're having our SRC elections, and there's some of the 
st uh, groups that you can, uh, besides Sasko and Dasso, um, Dasso being the lesser or the best of a bad bunch, a bunch are um, the Trans Collective and this group called V. And um, members from both groups have been calling for mandatory social justice lectures on campus. Now, um, you, any all reasonable students who've been reading this have immediately realized university isn't about mandatory lectures. We go to university because we want to specialize in something. But this is something that this transformation agenda just doesn't understand. And that they want to, that they create these boogeymen like rape culture and the patriarchy and misogyny and all these things that may to some degree exist, but the way that they push them forward just makes it a laughing stock and just they waste their time fighting straw men. But um, I've gone a little bit of a tangent here. Uh, Martin? <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, let me play devil's advocate for a moment here. Um, the argument against uh, Stalin Bosch as an Afrikaans university is essentially that these, um, I, I'm not going to say it's the black students because I've, I've, I've gone away from this idea that this is a black versus white thing. This Leicester video that they made was made by, I think, four white students. So let's just get that out of the way first. UCT students. UCT students. Oh, okay, UCT students. I either. apologize once again. Yeah. So it's not it's not like this is the blacks versus the whites. This is a bunch of uh, left-wing, irrational postmodernists versus the reasonable world. Now, it... It, it, it seems to be black versus white, but it's not. So anyway, what these social justice warriors of various races are saying is that uh, any South African university needs to be inclusive to all South Africans. Now they say you can't have a university of an exclu with a exclusionary policy like like a dominant language or something. Because that would that would um, exclude other South African students. Because uh, well, the point they make is that South um, we we don't really go to regional universities like in in America. If you're from New York, you'll go to a university in that state usually. In South Africa, it seems that everyone just goes anywhere. Uh, obviously, I think a lot of us. Um, have friends that went to Poch, uh, Poch of Strum. Uh, I know people went to Stellenbosch from Pretoria. So the, the, their argument is that, okay, so everyone goes everywhere here. So you can't just say uh, the Western Cape has a majority Afrikaans population, so therefore the language needs to be, uh, the language can be Afrikaans. So that is their argument, and they say by that being their argument, transformation is an an, an inclusive, uh, I don't even want to call it a philosophy, uh, an ideology. Um, now my contention with that is that, yeah, sure, <laughs> I mean if, if you look at it from that perspective it's inclusive but where does where do, does the right of, of um, people who disagree, you want to be taught in Afrikaans, you want to be taught in in Sepedi, in Zulu, where where do their um, their rights uh, come in? So how is it not exclusive on a broad in a broad sense if for people to um, to to have universities for specific uh, languages? I mean, uh, at the University of Pretoria, a lot of people are saying, uh, "Listen, the university is marketing itself as having Sepedi as a third language, but." we don't have the infrastructure to provide it or the capacity. And now that's a problem that social justice warriors are, are, um, are upset about here. And now this is, there's just a kind of inconsistency there. I'm like, why aren't you saying just go for English? Why are you even um, uh, going in favor of Sepedi? And then of course they say, because Sepedi is the majority language in this part of, um, okay, well, I don't know, is it? Uh, North Sutu, I guess, in this part of South Africa. And like, but that's not the tune they're singing in Stellenbosch. There it should be English. And then even uh, an extra dimension of inconsistency. At UCT, they're saying we need to dismantle this English colonial, uh, what culture, whatever. Um, so wh what exactly do they want? And now this is my problem. This is my biggest gripe with um, with transformation. 
because it started at okay, yeah, it's, I guess it started long ago, but it started at UCT by them saying, "Listen, this statue offends us," or something like that. It's it's uh, it violates the dignity of black students because this white imperialist oppressed black people in in those days. Um, so now, okay, great, the statue is gone. But as I said then. It's not gonna stop there. And now, at, even at UCT, they want the student demographics to reflect the national composition. Uh, so it won't matter if it's a, if Cape Town was 100% white. It needs to have 80% black students, or hell no, 89% black students. I think. Okay, well, I don't know. Anyway, so um, and 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 they want to reform the curriculum as well. So, and this is something that that I found interesting. That even some of my black friends are are perplexed by. Uh, how how is the science curriculum, for example, or uh, the biology curriculum, going to be transformed from a pre-apartheid context into a post-apartheid context? It can't. It's vague. And I think it was in the road to serfdom that Hayek um, said that these. Uh, uh, I don't know, uh, little oppressions, these institutionalized oppressions start with very vague language. Uh, so transformation. Transformation from what, firstly, and to what, secondly. Nobody can answer this question. Where are we going with transformation? Where, does it, where, where do we begin and where do we end? This is my problem. It doesn't mean anything. It's... it's Oh, I don't know. It's it's confusing and well, it's very dangerous because of that, uh, Christian. Yeah, <laughs> Nicholas said they want to do social justice classes. You know, <laughs> screw physics, screw maths. You know, let's learn how to use condoms and how oh, yeah. to not hurt people's feelings. It's <laughs> it's so ridiculous that these people even waste their time doing this. Um. Yeah, I, I'm from Stellenbosch University. Well, I, I'm still a student there. I was in uh, residence for three years, and I was in one of the main, you know, old Afrikaans residences. Uh, uh, I believe B.J. Foster and uh, Hendrik Verboot were were both in my residence back in the day, like 80 or 100 or 200 years ago, and and I within the res, you know, we had quite a lot of colored people, a few black people, and you know, I was friends with a lot of them. And in my three years, in the supposedly very Afrikaans res, it's not like anyone ever worshipped Furwurt or something that he was there. In fact, in my second year, very, uh, very uh, ironically or strangely, uh, some of our House commi Committee uh, members decided to apologize for my residence's actions in apartheid, which is, I think that's the silliest thing ever. But you know, besides that, that that was that was the the prevailing attitude. You know, so it's not like there was this culture of apartheid, which is ridiculous. I can't believe people say that. And with all my black and coloured friends in in the residence, um, you know, per personally, I never saw a, a racial altercation. Or uh, somebody being being disrespected or treated differently because of their race, and I'm glad I didn't because I wouldn't tolerate it. But even speaking to my coloured and black friends, you know, they laugh at this open Stellenbosch thing. They they think it's ridiculous um, that there is even such a movement. Because and I ask them, you, do you ever feel excluded? And they say, yeah, sure. Now and then there are like little frictions and things because if you're going to have lots of different people from different backgrounds um, living together, uh, you're going to have that. And I can tell you there's probably more <laughs> now and then frictions and stuff between white Afrikaans and white English people uh, or, or Afrikaans people from Gauteng and Afrikaans people from the, the Western Cape than there was between white and black people. So it's not an exclusive thing. And it, if this was Afrikaans, uh, Stellenbosch's most Afrikaans oldest res and whatever, I never saw any evidence of it being a racist place. And what's actually worse is my, I have a, uh, a black friend and a colored friend, uh, well, these two specifically, that they are actually being intimidated from coming out and speaking against them. If they say, 
no, I think I failed this exam, but I probably deserve this mark. And their friend saying, oh, no, I think the lecturer failed me because I'm black or <laughs> things things like that. And they, they kind of, and they get intimidated. Or my one friend, he learns Afrikaans. He's from KZN. Uh, he's Zulu, and he learned Afrikaans. And they, you know, then so his fellow black students insult him, you know. Um, not all of them, obviously, but here and there, he gets, you know, oh, you're learning the language of the oppressor. And, and he's kind of been excluded in many ways. And that's, so this whole, this Leicester thing, I think there are some exaggerations. Obviously there are, I think some of, some of these incidents are serious and they should be treated as such. But, uh, but we also saw one of the, the guys who was, appeared in the Leicester video from Alsenberg late, later on uh, whipping other students <laughs> with a, with a sham box. <laughs> So, yeah, you know, it's do what I say, don't do what I do. Uh, yeah, Nicholas? Yeah, well, it's exactly what you said. I, I did, haven't actually watched Leicester. I can't really get around to it. I have work to do. But I did read some of the pointed quotes that they claimed were very poignant. And most of them, now obviously there's going to be some, maybe some genuine frictions. This, this, this is going to happen in South Africa. Bad things happen. But... Uh, as you said, there's going to be a feeling of exclusion if any any group of people come together. Like I'm going to feel excluded if there's a group of people who are talking about something that I don't understand, and it may be that I feel like talking because I'm bored. I'm going, and the thing is, I'm going to have that, but I don't. I'm not going to complain about it. When one of the quotes which I saw for on this from Leicester was that this guy was feeling offended that a person didn't go next to him. Uh, in the uh, in the bathroom next uh, at the urinal, and I'm like, what? like, why do you care? And then I want to just note, there's a group of people that will never go next to another person in the urinal uh. because that's how bathrooms work. That you eat. In fact, it actually, I've actually had an experience like this when I was in a restaurant once. I didn't, uh, I didn't, uh, I chose not to go to the urinal because I don't like urinals. Uh, but and the guy at the urinal who was well, he's coloured, but he claimed he was black. Um, say, uh, accused me of being racist for not uh, uh, going to the urinal next to him. So um, I just, so I just ex uh, so he was obviously slightly drunk. So then I uh, use what I always do when I have to face drunk people, and I shout ten million dollars, and for some reason it uh, distracts them. True story. Um, but it just shows that. <laughs> It just shows that um, this mindset that they just like to look for things that offend them, and then come, uh, but they never come up with solutions. And um, to what Martin said earlier about how they don't know what they want, like this African curriculum that they want to come up with in UCT, they keep talking about this magical African curriculum, but they never suggest anything. They keep complaining that there's no African history, but the thing is. Whenever they, a white person or a colored person or Indian or an Asian writes African history, they say, oh, well, why are you writing our history? It's not your history. And then we'll, then we'll just respond, but you asked for some African history. And, but they'll reject it because it was a black person who didn't write it. And even worse, if a black person does write African history, they'll reject it because it actually tends to follow the European history, which as much as we can... Uh, uh, criticize European colonialism, for the most part, they kept accurate records. Mm. And, the, 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 uh, in fact, it's cited that one of the reasons why the um, it was so easy to persecute the Nazis was that the German culture of meticulousness allowed, uh, just, uh, allowed um, allies to see all the records of all the atrocities that they did. It wasn't the, the allies making it up, it was the Germans yeah. recording it. I mean, you must. We were talking about Nile Fergus, and you must read in his book *Civilization*. He talks specifically about uh, what some of the Germans did in uh, in Nile, Namibia, some of the atrocities and stuff. And <laughs> yeah, I don't want to laugh. Well, it's it's actually it's so they did some pretty bad stuff. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the people, and I'm sure the Nazis learned a lot from that. Um, yeah. Because you're the stuff, and that's that's not even to to speak of the. Of what the Dutch did, and what the English did, and what the French did, and what the Belgians did. So, I mean, it's not that people don't know this history of colonization and uh, and oppression and so on that 
that obviously that black people did face. Um, so that's this this obsession with colonialism. I don't want to get it into it too much because whatever you say, you're going to be called ignorant and racist and all the rest of it. Not that I care too much. But yeah, you guys. Uh yeah. So um, with this with this teaching of an African curriculum, um, especially African history, yeah, it doesn't. Uh, as Nicholas said, it doesn't matter like <laughs> who teaches it. What's gonna happen is the te the um lecturer is gonna say, okay, so we're gonna teach it from an African perspective now, and they're gonna start, and then the Europeans are gonna come, and the Africans are still gonna lose, and that is uh, the history is not gonna change because yeah. I think there is an assumption that I've actually noticed. I think I, I spoke to someone the other day. Um, there, I think there was an account posted on um, on News24 or something, one of these uh, column, columnists, who said that the Zulus actually won. Uh, the uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the battle, but it was a battle in the Anglo Anglo um, Zulu War. So they say they won, even though the Zulus were annihilated in that battle, and they say that the Zulus won the Battle of Blood River against the Boers, even though all accounts say that they lost. So we shouldn't be seeing this um, this uh, demand for an African curriculum necessarily just as another perspective, but in the end it's going to amount to historical revision, I, I think, uh, because they they simply will not accept that there's going to be a bad story to tell. I mean, either way, it's a bad story. I don't clap hands every time a history teacher says, and the Zulus were annihilated. It's a bad story. I don't agree with it. I, no matter how white my skin is, I, I think it's, it's terrible. But now, um, they're going to want to present this, probably the Zulus as this great empire that didn't, they didn't try to kill all the Khozas. They were very friendly. They were <laughs> open arms, accepting when the when they account, encountered other um, tribes, and they they didn't want to attack the 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 Dutch. But then, well, one thing led to another. Then they had to defend themselves. I'm already seeing uh, narratives like this popping up. That uh, it it all just comes down to this this irrational, I mean, it's a, it's a completely manufactured hate of white people. I mean, it's it, it just came about, I guess it's a continuation of, a, of the anti-apartheid movement that they didn't really know what to do with themselves now. But that's, that's what they're doing. And um, another thing on transformation as a system, um, as, as you pointed out earlier, Christian, when they they actually they assaulted, they attacked, they sieged this other college, I, I, what Elsenberg, Elsenberg uh, yeah. yeah, agricultural college. It's not that they went to protest. From what I read, they they literally attacked the place. They ran. No, it was in. it was assault. Yeah, yeah. and 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 thankfully the students. There, yeah, thankfully the students there aren't like like we are and like how our um our campuses are. We just like let them roll over us. No, they actually defended themselves, and I found myself really clapping hands at that video, even though people are already accusing those students of being racists for defending themselves. But this just shows how transformation, which is this lofty, peaceful, uh, nice thing that everyone's going to be a part of, it's, a, it's, it's coercive. It's a violent, a violent idea. I mean, even when I... When I get across, like, come to small groups if people want to talk transformation. Like, they would stand there in, in a political, like, a philosophical incubation chamber. They would talk and um, uh, tap each other on their backs and congratulate each other on how smart they are. Then I would just say, but wait a minute, guys. What about this and this aspect of transformation? Then they will raise their voices and they will essentially shout. They will laugh every time you say something. And they, they won't laugh like just, haha, they'll like move their bodies around frantically and, and laugh them, and yeah. clap hands. And it's like, but, oh, this guy's killing me. It's like, okay, yeah, so what? They, they don't, transformation, it doesn't allow for dissent. I mean, I've read this from um, people, uh, the critical theory movement uh, from the early 1930s, I think, that's still alive today. They, they wrote academic articles saying, do not allow dissent. 
and even I think in Saul Linsky's book Rules for Radicals, I think he even says that when you when you as a social justice warrior or whatever come across someone who is disagreeing with you, you need to you need to immediately make the point emotional and you need to turn it around on yeah. that person and ensure that they can't that they can't really say anything without them making themselves yeah. look like they're a racist or a sexist. So transformation is a, it's a and I'm capitalizing transformation. I'm not talking about change. I'm talking about this 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 ideology that South Africa is following now. It to be it's false. Just, yeah, it's it's a it's a coercive yeah. state ideology mm -hmm. like communism in the Soviet Union and uh, national socialism in Germany. Yeah. It's ah, uh, it's disgusting. It's I'm yeah. I'm for change, but it needs to be organic, you know. Of course, and yeah. it needs to be people who deserve to get to where they are. Nothing makes me happier than seeing people rising up from difficult circumstances um, mm. and conquering conquering the odds and getting to where they need to go um, based on their merit. And transformation implies the idea that that can't happen, that some people <laughs> are just go, are stuck in whatever and they need special help mm. or... Or also this idea that if if a, if anything a company or a student body or a government or a department or anything if it's diverse it's somehow better. And I, I'm not anti it being diverse at all. I'm just saying there's no just you can't make it diverse. Just if you make it diverse, it's not going to be better. Chances are it's going to be worse because mm. you're going to have bad dynamics and you're not going to have the best possible people in there. Yeah. Yeah, but okay. Yeah. Nicholas, anything? Yeah, I think we've exhausted this topic. It's all very yeah. depressing. Oh, it's not exhausted at all. No, no, no. I've we've <laughs> still got a few battles to to fight. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think for for purposes of this podcast, I think we've we've given our opinions quite comprehensively. Yeah, and I invite. Hours. Yeah, I invite. Um, anyone who's enjoyed this discussion to really to check out our blog at salcell.civilrights.org.za all the details will obviously be in the description below and yeah uh, we have a lot of material on transformation on whatever um, we also discussed here and yeah thank you for uh, tuning in um, can I can I just have a, a closing remark yeah yeah I just want to say it's not when we speak of us and them, especially in this podcast, we're not talking about white and black or rich or poor or, or anything like that, not classes or races or genders. We're talking about people who are decent and people who are not. You know, people who know how to go about their business in a decent way and people who, who go about changing things or doing things the wrong way. I yeah, just want to make that clear. This is high. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we believe in people being free to do what they want. They believe in forcing people to do something. That is yeah, the us exactly. and the them. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, thank you guys for participating, of course. Uh, and we'll do this again soon. Sure, cheers. cheers.